music played at this summer's proms, and the man who wrote it is this week's Great Life. Nominating him is the composer Howard Goodall. His work spans musicals, choral music and TV themes. He's a founder signatory of the Music Manifesto. Its aim is to bring more music into more lives. Howard, who is your choice as Great Life? My choice is the great English composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who was, for about five years, one of the most famous composers in the world. Between about 1900 and 1905, around there, one of the pieces he wrote, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, really was an incredibly famous piece, and he was a very well-known person. But he died young, at the age of 37, and now he's not so well-known, but I think he is a very great and a very inspiring character in British musical history. I should also say... He was a black composer at that time in Victorian England, which was a, an unusual thing. And I think his status as a very successful black composer at that time in the classical music world is something of which we should be more proud and make much more fuss. Now, you've given some indication early on that he had a, many different kinds of music, that he, he obviously turned his hand to many things. Is that something that you could identify with? Well, I can identify with one or two things. Obviously, I'm not black and struggling in a white world like he was, never mind uh, Victorian or Edwardian England. But I can identify with the fact that he wrote music. He was very well trained classically, but he wrote music that was very accessible to audiences at first listen and wasn't really afraid to write music that people would instantly enjoy. Now, that's something I identify with. And I think there is a slightly allergic reaction in a lot of the kind of traditional classical music world to music that's instantly enjoyable. There must be something wrong with it if some people feel... If it's instantly accessible to audiences. And that's what I do. I have to write things that are instantly accessible, especially for TV and for film and things like this. So I do identify with that. I obviously identify... Uh, he and I had a similar hairstyle as well. <laughs> yeah, well, if you look at photographs of him, and, and there are a few, because obviously that is, it's the great age of photography, and he has that slightly up-tilted chin that many people did have in the portraits of that time. There's a great cloud of dark hair, isn't there? And a rather slightly candid look, I think. Yes, a kind of elegance about him. He's much better looking than I am, obviously, and I think what is amazing about him was he clearly had a kind of nobility that everybody noticed, a kind of calm, gentle nobility. And I think that, as well as being a great musician, I think probably he was a, quite a big figure in terms of establishing, for many people, a different kind of classical musician at that period of time. So the great life is Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Now, the name might have been some kind of homage to the poet. He was born in 1875, the son of Alice Hare of Hoban and Daniel Taylor, a black medical student from Sierra Leone, whose British education was sponsored by Methodist missionaries. Sometime around the birth, Daniel Taylor returned to Africa. Guiding us through Samuel Coleridge Taylor's great life is Stephen Banfield, professor of music at Bristol University. Now... We have here the, these fairly spare facts that his mother, Alice, later married a, a railway worker. But it was hardly a conventional background, was it, for classical music? I mean, relatively poor, working class even. So how did he get to the Royal College of Music? He was spotted. There was apparently musical talent on his mother's side. Two of his mother's siblings, I think it was siblings, were music teachers. And he learned the violin quite young and was apparently, this is anecdotal, even the family weren't sure it was true, apparently he was spotted playing marbles in the gutter with a violin under his arm and some local worthy decided it was time he was given proper lessons. But he didn't lack local sponsors, particularly one called Colonel Walters. He was a prize chorister of Colonel Walters in two churches, I think. And that, of course, was a perfect music education, still is, for children with musical talent, with or without means. His teachers at the Royal College, you know, how important can you see this formative effect on his later work? Well, Stanford was his composition teacher, and that was an enormously important relationship. It was for all of Stanford's pupils, actually. Uh, almost every composer of note passed through his hands in that generation and several others. He was Stanford's favourite pupil, he wrote exactly the kind of music Stanford wanted his pupils to write. And, of course, he was terribly young. He went there at 15. He stayed five years till he was 20, by which time he was already becoming quite famous. So he benefited enormously from being able to make his mark but have that support at the same time. And Stanford was absolutely crucial to that. Well, his early performances on home ground were at the public hall in Croydon. After his first concert, he was too shy to take a curtain call, apparently. And when he won a composition award in 1893, a Croydon newspaper described the young composer as plucky, persevering and painstaking. <laughs> 
By the time of his last year at college in 1896, he was starting to sell short salon pieces. What were they like? A lot of his music is very, very attractive. But what's odd about it is you'd never guess, in a way, this is who's written it. I mean, I think you'd think this was music of this period written by some white guy in a suit uh, with a moustache. I mean, it's strange that his music sounds very European. I mean, that in the broadest sense of the word European, and a very much of its time, a kind of gentility about it. You could imagine it written by a very large number of composers. But you know what? That's absolutely par for the course. And my whole thing about composers is you should not try and be yourself until you that comes through of its own accord. And all composers start by sounding like someone else. Coleridge Taylor was a great fan of Dvorak, so his music, quite not surprisingly, sounds a bit like Dvorak. But that's what you do when you're a young composer. You sound like the people you like. So his early pieces, however, were picked up by the musical establishment. When he, did, he did get friends sort of in, in Elgar's circle, for example. Yes. Elgar did him a very good turn when Elgar was too busy to write a piece for the Three Choirs Festival in Gloucester. I think it was in 1897 or 1898. He suggested Coleridge Taylor in his place, and Coleridge Taylor wrote his ballade for orchestra, which has now been recorded. Elgar was very keen to do that good turn. I think he believed in him. How much of his music he had seen or heard by that stage, I'm not sure. And he was also a regular, wasn't he, at the house of Nimrod from the Enigma Variations? Of Jaeger, yes, who was a big sort of um, figure in Victorian and early Edwardian musical life in Britain. He was kind of a critic and he knew everybody and he was a networker, it would be the modern equivalent, a sort of mover and a shaker. And he too was a believer in Coleridge Taylor's talent. I mean, I think one of the things that keeps coming up with this story of his life is that there are many things that were an obstacle to him because he was black in a white world. But one of the odd things about his story is that in musical terms, actually, there weren't as many obstacles as you might imagine there might be. And in fact, most of the musical luminaries around that time were very supportive to him and, and helpful to him. So here he is receiving this kind of benign patronage. He was a regular visitor to August Yeager's house, and he took with him a fellow student who would soon be his wife, Jessie Fleetwood Wormsley. In 1897, Yeager wrote to Elgar in the idiom of the day of the coming man. The young nigger, he is only 21. That boy will do great things. I have before me a morning and evening church service which I consider splendidly fresh and original. He is a genius, I feel sure, if ever an English composer was. His mother is English, his father a full-blooded nigger. Have you seen his seven African romances? They are strange and yet beautiful when one gets used to his peculiarities or originality. Do get them. A word of appreciation from you would give him courage. A letter from August Jaeger to Edward Elgar. How good it's really quite hard to listen to that today, isn't it? That sort of casual racism. Yes, it is very hard to listen to that, but we are talking about, you know, the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th, 20th century. And, you know, we all know what that period was like and how it would have been for a, a black person in a very white society. Not only that, a white society that believed it was pretty much destined to rule the world, which is that's quite a big thing to take on. However, first of all, there were many more black people in Britain at that time than I think it was often believed was the case. And, for example, someone like Coleridge Taylor's father came to England for professional training. In the med you know, he came for medical training. So many of the black people who were in England, who came from the colonies in various parts of the empire, were intelligent, highly motivated, sort of uh, middle-class people. So it's not as if your average person in the street had a particularly realistic idea of uh, who they're talking about, because they might go and see what, you know, a kind of early form of minstrel show where the you know, native peoples from around the empire were sort of lampooned in a jokey way and see ridiculous songs and you know, racist, by our modern standards, very racist entertainments. And part of what's happened in the period since then is that to some extent the white community has not disentangled those two things and understood that there were many black people here, widespread though not perhaps numerous, who contributed in all sorts of different ways. Stephen Banfield talked about the relatively conventional nature of much of his early work, but can you see already that he was beginning to be concerned to reflect his African heritage in his music? The first prod in that direction, I think, was when he met the American black American poet Paul Dunbar, which I think was in 1896 or 7. That was when his black consciousness, as we would later call it, I suppose, really began to arise. I think throughout his life there's a question of 
high, what would now be called hybridity. He had two identities. He had a perfectly secure lower middle class identity as an Englishman. And there's that wonderful story that when he first went to America and was challenged on entering a white railway carriage, he said, but I'm an Englishman. He has that, but he also has, was it a desire or was it an obligation or a duty or was it a bit of both to help his African brethren, which was the kind of phrase that he began to use because he was reading the work of others, particularly the American racial reformers, such as Booker T. Washington and W. Du Bois, whose book The Souls of Black Folk was really revolutionary. And Coleridge Taylor read that and was enormously influenced by it. So he has these two sides. How would he... he came across the Fisk University Jubilee Singers. Now, they obviously had an influence on... Who were they? The Fisk Jubilee Singers were incredibly important figures. They were the sons and daughters of slaves, of freed slaves, who set up a choir to raise money by going around singing arrangements of uh, spirituals, to raise money to build a college for black people to be taught in in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and they travelled around America, first of all, and sang these spirituals. Now, for many people in music and beyond in the wider society, this was the first time they'd heard these spirituals sort of wrapped up in a kind of conventional musical sense, i.e. not being sung by people in a field, but actually being sung with part arrangements and dressed up into arrangements. And they collected a vast archive, as it were, of these spirituals and sang them, and then sang them all over the States. And then in 1872, they came to Britain. One of the original Fisk Jubilee singers, a chap called Frederick Luden, or Luden, um, Coleridge Taylor got to know and became a friend of his. In fact, he, he referred to their manager, the deeply lamented Frederick J. Luden, manager of the famous Jubilee singers, through who I first learned to appreciate the beautiful folk music of my race and who did so much to make it known the world over. In 1900, he took part in the first Pan-African Conference. But how profound, I mean, just coming back on this, how profound do you think you can ever see the African influence in his work? There's a separation between the African works and the non-African ones. But one example of this, which is a purely practical one, is that he did make a wonderful collection of mostly Negro spiritual arrangements for piano the 24 Negro Melodies. But he didn't publish them in England. They were published in America. And actually, there was very little cross-fertilisation of American and British publications in those days. It's, it's still true with things like musicals today, actually. You wouldn't have been able to find those pieces in Britain. You still can't, whereas all of his English works you'd get in second-hand bookshops. So there were two markets going on here, and the Americans got to know those arrangements far better than the English did because of the publishing arrangement. So there's a kind of might have been there. I'm not sure the British ever really grasped him as an arranger of Negro melodies. Well, let's come now to the piece of music that brought Coleridge Taylor fame, and that's Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. It was composed in 1898, part of a trilogy of scenes, settings of Longfellow's poem. It was first performed in its entirety at the Royal Albert Hall in 1900, and it was immediately a favourite with choruses. Howard, what is so great about it? First of all, it's great fun. There's no doubt about it. This is fun music to enjoy. And audiences and choruses have noticed that right from the start. We have disentangled the fact that if it were written in Italian, it would probably have, would have stayed into the, in the traditional classical repertoire much longer. There are beautiful tunes in it. There are some absolutely wonderful moments of music in it. If you imagine... I mean, for me, it's a kind of a cross between Arthur Sullivan and Puccini... Now, that's quite a big coming together of styles. You know, with Puccini, when he's doing Madame Butterfly or Turandot, he does little tiny whiffs of something a little bit oriental, a bit of a gong here and a little da 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 here to say, oh, we're somewhere in the East. But really, it's Puccini, it's Italian music of the early 20th century. And that's a bit that's going on with Coleridge Taylor here. There's no attempt really to do any kind of Native American rhythms or anything like that. And within about five years, there were three big pieces that every choral society did all the time. Hiawatha was one of them, the Messiah was the other, and a piece by Arthur Sullivan called The Golden Legend was the third. Now, they did these things to death. They were so popular. 
I mean, it's very hard to imagine that now, but I think part of the reason it's so enjoyable probably to go along and perform in if you're a, in a chorus society is because it's very dramatic. It's not talking about, you know, some sort of gentle story here. These are very, very imagistic stories. It's a great legend set in some exotic place, and, of course, at the time, it's very fashionable to talk about exotic legends from something like the uh, Native Americans. Do you have a favourite passage within it? I mean, is, is it the great love theme? Well, there is a wonderful aria called On Away Awake, Beloved, which is very popular with many people, which is absolutely gorgeous. And if it were in a Puccini opera, it would be on everybody's opera highlights. As simple as that. Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha, which the publisher Novello had bought outright for 15 guineas. By his late 20s, Taylor was living in Croydon with his wife, Jessie. They had two children, Gwendolyn, who later called herself Avril, and a son, Hiawatha. Both grew up to be musicians, to support the family, and to buy himself time for composing. He taught, he adjudicated at festivals, he wrote songs for cash, conducted amateur choirs. He became professor of composition at Trinity College, director of the Rochester Choral Society, and conductor of the Handel Society, all before he was 30. Um, Howard, does that sound a familiar kind of workload? All these things that a composer has to do just to make ends meet and be creatively fulfilled? Yes. I mean, I think that were he to live now, one of the things that he would benefit enormously from is the modern laws on copyright. And you'd never give away a piece now for a one-off sum straight away and never get another royalty again. I mean, it's a hideous thought. So that's the thing that would change. The other thing is there are probably more opportunities now for composers to do things like write for TV and radio and uh, film and whatnot. But he did the equivalent, which was to write songs anybody wanted, a bespoke song, a piece of music here for this occasion, to conduct choral societies, to conduct orchestras, to do all these things, yes. I mean, but that's always been the case. And in fact, as far as I know, um, Stephen would probably uh, shoot me down in flames for this, but I think the idea that composers are kind of poverty-stricken in a garret, only writing for their things, is pretty much based on one person, Berlioz. I mean, all the other composers I can ever think of were full-on working composers who did tons of things all the time, Mozart, Bach, all these people, were job composers. So amongst the different genres that he inevitably had to turn his hand to, how successful was the music for theatre? He wasn't brought up with any theatrical experience and Jaeger made a slightly sort of backhanded comment saying, oh I hate to think what his incidental music is going to be like, he's probably never even been in a theatre in his life. But he soon learnt to love it. He did a number of incidental scores for Herbert Beerbohm Tree, who was about as high as you could go of course in terms of theatrical impresario and director. The first thing any composer has to learn when writing for the theatre, be it a musical or incidental music, it's just like film music today. It was the equivalent in Coleridge Taylor's day, writing for the West End Theatre, is that most of the music is going to get cut. And there are wonderful stories of Beerbohm Tree, who was completely unmusical, was saying, uh, no, no, I, I want you to cut right here. I don't want all that twiddly stuff afterwards. Most composers would not take that. Coleridge Taylor was modest enough, probably interested enough in the theatre to accept that kind of stricture. I'm quite sure he would have gone on to do film music if he'd lived longer, you know, he, he would have been cut out for that. Well, ever since Hawath had first been performed, Samuel Coleridge Taylor had had a following in the United States, and there were several Coleridge Taylor societies. In 1904, he was at last able to visit at the invitation of Mrs. Mamie Hillier, who'd founded the Washington Appreciation Society. The Hilliers, keen musicians and black, warned him of segregation in the USA, and they sent him a copy of William Du Bois's writings. Booker T. Washington wrote the biographical notes for Coleridge Taylor's 24 Negro Melodies. He is the foremost musician of his race, an inspiration to the Negro since he himself, the child of an African father, is the embodiment of what are the possibilities of the Negro under favorable environment. It is especially gratifying that at this time, when interest in the plantation song seems to be dying out with the generation that gave them birth, when the Negro song is in too many minds associated with rag music, and the more rehensible coon song, that the most cultivated musician of his race, a man of the highest aesthetic ideal, should seek to give performance to the folk songs of his people by giving them a new interpretation and an added dignity. Booker T. Washington on Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Stephen Banfield, why was his work so important in the United States? 
there were commercial black composers, there were theatre composers, but they didn't have that classical music choral society, utterly respectable church concert soiree composer. It's very difficult to find a single word for that other than respectability. And the people who latched on to Coleridge Taylor, I think, were latching on to that. It was an amazing experience for him to go to the USA and be so lionised, but at the same time he was not willing to relinquish what he saw as his musical standards in the interests of being racially iconic. He would not, for instance, allow Hiawatha to be performed with piano. He said, I must have an orchestra. Uh, this is a work that needs a good professional or almost professional orchestra. The problem was that there were no black orchestral musicians, or not enough, to form an orchestra in Washington at that time, or probably anywhere else. In the end, the solution was to hire the US Marines Band and augment it with some string players. But here were white, I suppose, federal employees playing under a black conductor. That must have been quite a coup for all concerned, I think. And this was important on a wider scale, as Booker T. Washington wrote to Coleridge Taylor. In composing Hiawatha, you have done the colored people of the United States a service which I am sure you never dreamed of when composing it. It acts as a source of inspiration to us, not only musically, but in other lines of endeavor. Well, on his return from America, Coleridge Taylor's fame may have increased, but there was no let up in the workload. No other work was received with as much enthusiasm as Hiawatha. Some, like the Atonement, were a struggle, but from 1908 onwards he gained more recognition with another choral work, The Tale of Old Japan, and Violin Concerto. He made two further trips to the States and in 1910 became Professor of Composition at the Guildhall School of Music. Was he generous, do you think, Stephen, with his time and money towards other musicians? Yes, he was. As far as I can tell, he was a thoroughly lovable person. I wish I could have met him. I mean, there are certain composers I'm very glad I couldn't meet. Elgar, for instance. <laughs> I should think that would have been absolute horror to try and have a sociable conversation with him. But Coleridge Taylor's someone surely everyone would love to have met. He was very generous with his time and with his money. Apparently there was a continual stream of people knocking at his door in Croydon, begging for this and that, white and black. And he kind of made a joke of it, but seemed always to have given them something. Well, in August 1912, he collapsed on West Croydon Railway Station, but he managed to stagger home to bed. He died at the beginning of September, delirious, conducting an imaginary performance of the Violin Concerto. He was 37. Poignant, Howard. Very poignant. In fact, there are two very poignant things about that final stage. He wrote that Violin Concerto for a, a patron in America, and in fact, the parts he wrote out himself for all the orchestra parts were put on the Titanic, so he never got there. So he had to hurriedly write the entire orchestral score and all the parts all out again for its first performance, which he never made. He then died with this piece in his ears, and he may have felt very sad if he'd known how long it would be before that piece got a proper airing again. And, and you know, it was only recorded last year, this beautiful piece by this important composer. And when you now listen to it, particularly the middle movement, it is, it's astonishing. And what is so tragic about this is what he might then have gone on to write had he not succumb to illness. Well, a few months before he died, Samuel Coleridge Taylor commented on a report in the Croydon Guardian about a debating group in Purley. A vicar had presided and a barrister had addressed the debate, the Negro problem in North America. Amongst the assertions that black men had ape-like skulls, were a lower order of humans and had never managed to improve themselves. Here is part of Samuel Coleridge Taylor's letter to the paper in response. No one realises more than I that coloured people have not yet taken their place in the scheme of things, but to say they never will is arrogant rubbish and an insult to the God in whom they profess to believe. The fact is that there is an appalling amount of ignorance amongst English people regarding the Negro and his doings, as expressed by the clergyman in the Pearly Lecture. I forget his name and am away from home, the Birmingham people having engaged me to direct something that has come out of my ill-formed skull. Personally, I consider myself the equal of any white man who ever lived, and no one could ever change me in that respect. On the other hand, no man reverences worth more than I, irrespective of colour and creed. May I further remind the lecturer that really great people always see the best in others. It is the little man who looks for the worst and finds it. It is a peculiar thing that, almost without exception, all distinguished white men have been favourably disposed towards their black brethren. 
No woman has ever been more courteous to me than a certain member of our own English royal family, and no man so more than President Roosevelt. What was the dignified response there to prejudice from Samuel Coleridge Taylor? Howard, if you have to pick out what you think is essentially great about him, was it the work? Was it his attitude? I don't think with any composer you can disentangle who they were and what they were and their music. I know that there are people who disagree with me on this, but I think that when you see what the whole is, it helps you love or hate their music, whoever they may be. And I feel that Coleridge Taylor's contribution and his courage is what you hear in his music. And I find it both moving and immensely inspirational to think that this amazingly brave person existed and wrote that music in my country, and I'm very proud that he was British. And indeed, Coleridge Taylor's epitaph reads, Too young to die, his great simplicity, his happy courage in an alien world, his gentleness made all that knew him love him. I agree with Howard. I don't think you can separate the person from the music. The music is there. It is a legacy which we have not yet explored. One thing I would like to say is that I don't think it's true to say that he went off after showing early promise. There's been a kind of tendency to think that. He wrote some wonderful pieces at all points in his career. There's the early clarinet quintet, there's Hiawatha, there's the fantastic Variations on an African Air, which are a marvellous orchestral piece which ought to be in the repertoire and aren't. There's his best choral work, A Tale of Old Japan, and then there's finally the, the Violin Concerto, which, which could be his best work. It's a wonderful piece. I hear that, the second theme in that last movement there, I hear the sense of struggle and it's kind of sort of cut short at the end. Uh, it's almost an icon of his life. It's very moving. You can't forget the man, but the music is there as a legacy that needs to be rediscovered and seen whole. Well, my thanks to the reader, Christopher Colquhoun, to Stephen Banfield and to Howard Goodall, who proposed today's great life, the composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor. And we'll end with a snatch of the violin concerto. Mm -hmm. 